بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على سيد الرسل وخاتم الانبياء وعلى اله الاسكياء واصحابه الاتقياء اما بعد الحمد لله today by the grace and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we started from the fourth juz of the Quran inshallah by the end of the night we will have completed the half of the fifth juz of the Quran it's like just yesterday Ramadan started and we're already through almost five juz of the Qur'an, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. A part of today's recitation, there's a very beautiful verse of the Qur'an that I wanted to discuss, inshallah. But before I discuss the verse, there are certain aspects of this, certain discussions, certain aspects that need to be discussed of this verse prior to discussing the verse itself. We all realize that as people in the world, we have responsibilities. Every person has their responsibility. Men have their responsibility, women have their responsibility. And those responsibilities we will be held accountable by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for how do we execute those responsibilities. Now, when it comes to executing a responsibility, you can't execute it just halfway through and walk away. You have to make sure you follow it all the way through. And that's actually a very important aspect of the deen, that whenever you start something, you make sure you see that action right till the end, not halfway through. So if you're fasting, even if it's a nafal fast, not even, a volunteer, not even an obligatory fast, a nafal fast, According to the Hanafi position, if a person starts a nafal fast and for some reason does not complete it, starting that nafal fast was a voluntary act, but now to complete it is mandatory. So which means, in, let's say by Dhuhr Salah, it was a random day in August and you started fasting and by Dhuhr you felt really hungry and you decided to break the fast. Now that fast is mandatory upon you to make up. You have to do qadab. It's no longer nafal anymore. Because once you started it, that was your choice. But now to see it all the way through to the end, it's your responsibility. Allah says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, atiyu Allah wa atiyu Rasul, wa la tuqtiru a'malakum. All those who believe, obey Allah and the Messenger, and do not nullify, do not break your actions halfway through. So we know that one of our responsibilities is to make sure we provide halal income for our families. We work day and night, mashallah, you know, at our jobs, leave home every morning, come back every evening, exhausted. Some of us travel, we don't see our families for days of the week. Some of us have left our mother and father back home and we've been in this country for years. Probably don't even get to meet them on the Eid. Maybe couldn't attend their janazah prayer. So much work that's involved in providing food for our family. And we gather this empire of wealth. That responsibility of the wealth we will be held accountable for by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah will ask us on the Day of Judgment. Where did you earn this wealth from? Did you violate the laws of Allah while earning this wealth? Did you pray your salah while earning this wealth? All of these questions will, ask, will, be, asked, will be asked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But this is not what I'm here to discuss today. Because that part of the discussion we've heard in Jummah Khutbahs and so on. What I would like to talk about is making sure we see the responsibility of our wealth not just halfway through our journey, but right through till the end. And what is that? Many of us feel that our responsibility to our wealth is for as long as we live. But the day we die, our responsibility towards our wealth now comes to an end. But the reality is that from an Islamic standpoint, the responsibility that you have towards your wealth doesn't end when you die, it actually goes beyond that as well. That's what the Prophet ﷺ said, as a very famous narration that Imam Bukhari narrates in his Sahih. That no person should die, <clears throat> no person should spend two nights, no person should spend two nights without having a will written. So that he can make sure the responsibility that he owes towards his wealth is seen through right till the end. There is another narration of the Prophet ﷺ. Imam Ahmad alayhi, narrates it in his Musnad. Very interesting narration. The Prophet says, sometimes a person will live a life in which he does good deeds for 70 years. Can you imagine that? Who can claim here that they've done good deeds for 70 years? The Prophet is saying a person may do good deeds for 70 years, but because of his negligence towards his will and his wealth will not be distributed properly after his death, if wrong happens after he dies in regards to his wealth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will seal his good deeds and he will be sent to the fire of hell. And the hadith continues on. There will be another person who may have not spent his entire life doing good deeds. Maybe the average person. But one thing he made sure was that after he died, the responsibility of his wealth was seen right till the end. The Prophet ﷺ says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give him many good deeds. And this deed in itself will be his ticket into Jannah. And we've seen this, how great of a responsibility it is. Many of us, we don't pay attention to writing our wills. And we've seen this from back home, I've seen this many times, okay? Brothers who love each other right to the end. They took care of their father, they looked after their father, they were one big family. As soon as the father died, he left behind an estate of a half a million dollars, or whatever it was. 
And these two brothers begin to fight on who owed how much, who owned the house, who owned the business, who gets how much portion of the business. I did labor for the business, I worked for the business, but the business belonged to the dad. And there are so many complications that take place. And because these things were not cleared up, these two brothers will probably not speak to each other for the rest of their life. And you know how there's a concept of sadaqah jariyah, where you do a good deed and it continues even after you die? There's the opposite as well. Where you make a sin, and the sin is such that as long as you, as long as the people who follow that sin, or you're the source of that sin, you will continue to get that punishment. So you left the world, leaving a trap for your children to fall into, so once they fall into it, they'll never speak again, for as long as they have hatred and animosity towards each other, you will be the one who will get that punishment inside your grave. Hence the Prophet saying, 70 years of good deed, washed right out the window, because you did not see the responsibility of your wealth right till the end. When a person passes away, there are four steps that you need to follow through in regards to their wealth. What are the four? These are what we call al-huquq muqaddamatun ala al-irf. The responsibilities that are mandated upon a person prior to distributing the wealth amongst the inheritors. There are three responsibilities prior to distributing the inheritance, and the fourth one is the distribution of the inheritance itself. What are the three prior responsibilities? The first is, when a person passes away, you need to make sure that their wealth is used to take care of their shrouding and their burial. Takfeen and tatfeen, these are the two words. Takfeen means their shrouding, <coughs> to make sure they are washed properly, they are shrouded properly. And tatfeen is to ensure that they are buried properly. When it comes to shrouding a person, the scholars, they say, that shroud should be selected, which is equivalent to what that person would generally wear on the Jum'ah prayer. You guys understand? Now, if a person has left a million dollars behind, it doesn't mean you spend half a million buying two pieces of cloth just to wrap that person in. Whatever that person would wear generally to the Jum'ah prayer, equivalent to that will be purchased in white cloth, and that person will be wrapped inside it, and he will be sent to the, to the grave. For men, there are three cloths that the body will be buried in. For women, there are five cloths in which their body will be buried in when they are lowered to the ground. And it's interesting, right? Today, we, wear, we spend so much time on focusing on these clothes, but in reality, these are the same clothes that may not even reach to us with the grave. A new pair of cloth will come that will be absolutely unbiased and it will be there to witness against us on the Day of Judgment in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah protect us all. The second aspect is tadfeen. Tadfeen is to make sure the burial takes place properly. When it comes to the burial, again, the burial should not be extremely lavish and extravagant. The burial should be simple. From an Islamic standpoint, we do not even believe in the concept of the coffin. But unfortunately, because of the land we live in and the law that abides, some states mandate a coffin. If your state mandates a coffin, the coffin should be the bare minimum. Remember, living, burying the body in a vault, right? At a metal vault is not going to save you from the questioning of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those angels will find their way to pick their lock and make it inside that vault as well. There's nowhere that you can run from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran today, we recited, No person can die without the will of Allah. And when Allah wills for you to die, then nothing can stop you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is all lavish wasting. We've seen people, they waste so much money, so much money on, the, on the shrouding as well. They have these wakes where they dress the person up in the favorite suit they had and make sure they groom the person. So much money is being wasted. This is not going to help you with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to look at what suit you're wearing when you're resurrected on the Day of Judgment. Allah is going to look at your deeds. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَنْظُرُ إِلَىٰ سُوَرِكُمْ أَمْوَالِكُمْ وَلَكِنْ يَنْظُرُ إِلَىٰ قُلُوبِكُمْ أَعْمَالِكُمْ Right, as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa tells us. After the burial is over, after the burial is over, after the first part is taken care of, the second responsibility you have in regards to the wealth of the, of the deceased is to make sure you take care of all of their debts. So any debts they have outstanding, now they need to be paid off. If all of the wealth is used up in this process, so be it, there will be no inheritance after that. But you will first make sure all the debts are paid off. Now, if multiple people gather together, and 10 people are claiming that that person owes me money, that person owes me money. Let's say, for example, I passed away and I left behind $100,000. And 10 people gather together, let's say 12 people, for, our, for the example. Sake. 12 people gather together and they say, he owes me money. So the first thing you will do is you will see who has Dayna Qawi and who has Dayna Da'if. Dayna Qawi is that debt which is strong and firm. Dayna Da'if is that debt which is weak. What is the difference between both? Dayna Qawi is a debt which has a proof to it. Either the person passing away said himself, I owe that person money. Or that person brings a written contract. Or he brings two witnesses saying, this is what he owed me. That's what you call a solid debt. It's strong. That debt should be paid off. And now, that Dayna Da'if is a weak debt where a person from the gathering just stands up and says, he owes me money. It could be true. could be lying. Wallahu alam. 
So when there are multiple debtors gathered together, multiple collectors gathered together, what we do is we first categorize who is in which category. So let's say two of these people were from the Dayna Da'if, the weak category. The ten that are from the strong category, now what we will do is, we will distribute the hundred thousand equally to the ten. Not first come, first serve. You guys understand that? It's not that the first person comes, you pay him a hundred thousand, the other guys that are standing there, they don't get anything. The ten people, you will distribute the wealth equally amongst ten. Each person will get ten thousand dollars, and then they will be sent away. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he would lead a janazah, he would first ask, does this person have any outstanding debt? And if that person had an outstanding debt, the Prophet would not lead the janazah prayer. He would turn around and say, is anyone willing to pay off the debt of your brother? And the people in the congregation would take responsibility, I'll take care of 2,000, I'll take care of 1,000, I'll take care of 5,000, until the debt was settled, and then the Prophet would lead the janazah for that prayer. Okay? The third thing that needs to be done is that after you've taken care of the burial expenses, after you've taken care of the debts, now if there remains money that is outstanding, you will see if that person bequested any money for a particular person. And that bequest cannot exceed how much? One third of that person's wealth. Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas radiallahu anhu, as Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi narrates in the Sahih, he became very ill, and he himself mentions, I was at the verge of death, I was about to pass away. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to me and he said, O Messenger of Allah, I have so much money, I'm a wealthy person, but I only have one daughter to leave it all to. Can I not give some of my wealth in charity? The Prophet ﷺ said, yes, you can. He said, can I give two-thirds of my wealth in charity? The Prophet said, that's too much. He said, I want half of my wealth. The Prophet said, that's too much. He said, what about one-third of my wealth? The Prophet said, that's okay, but even that's too much. He said, it's okay, but it's a little too excessive. And then the Prophet said a very interesting statement at the end. He said, I would rather you leave your family behind as being rich rather than leaving them behind poor and they go around asking people for money. I would rather you leave them behind wealthy, that you leave them with money so that they can be sufficient and they can move on with their lives as well. So here we learn from this hadith of Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas that the wasiyah, the bequest, should not be more than one third. Now, there another principle you have to bear in mind, you cannot bequest money to someone who is already inheriting from you. So let's say for example, I were to pass away and I have a son. And my son, Islamically, as mandated by the Quran, the Shaykh will recite the ayah very soon, is already given a portion of my wealth because he's my son. Now, I can't bequest him anything extra because he already has a portion. It ha the bequest has to be to someone who is not linked to my wiratha already, someone who already is an inheriting. After you take care of the bequesting, the three principles, the three, uh, uh, con the three important criteria or the three responsibilities prior to the actual inheritance have been taken care of. Now, when it comes to the inheritance itself, you must make sure you distribute your wealth according to Islam. Don't think that you can outgo or cheat somehow the Islamic law. Some people, they give all of their wealth to one son and they leave their daughters behind. I've seen this happen so much in Chicago. Girls will come to me and they say, Shaykh, my father is very old, he's a very wealthy man, but he believes culturally that women shouldn't get anything. Can you please go and explain to him? He's already distributed the wealth, he's told everyone how much they get, and he's made it clear that I won't get anything. Or he's told me I'll get very little. Remember the hadith of the Prophet, 70 years of ibadah, and all of it's washed down because you're trying to deprive someone from a right that Allah has given to them. A right that Allah has given to them. You must be careful of this matter. And with that, the ayat, the whole, the, I mean, the ayat in, the, in Surah An-Nisa, we will read them inshallah. But that's where the responsibility, once the wealth has been distributed properly, that's where you can make sure that you have fulfilled the responsibility. So all of these things, the four things that I said, they should be a part of your will. You should write a will. These are the mandatory things that you need to write down. That how to shroud me how to bury me, how to take care of my debts, how to take care of my, my bequests, and then at the end, how to, how to take care of it, distributing my inheritance. And this should be written down, and it should be shown to two witnesses. You should show to two witnesses that this is what I have written, and then put it somewhere safe away, and put an individual responsible of executing the wasiyah after you pass away. So now you need to appoint someone, that if I were to die, so-and-so imam, or so-and-so uncle, or so-and-so auntie is responsible of making sure everything goes according to how I wanted it to be. And a part of that will, one extra thing you can add, is anything else that you want. You might say that I, this is the legal aspect, now you can add more than that as well. You can say, I would like for my children, I, I request them to be punctual on their salah. You understand? Extra things you can write in your will as well. I would like my children to build a masjid for the sake of Allah, for our entire family, whatever wish. When I pass away, I would like to be buried in, in, in the local graveyard, and my body shouldn't be done this with, it shouldn't be done that with, you shouldn't cry for more than three days, Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can write extra wasiyah and advice inside there as well, nasiha and advice in there as well. 
So we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us all the tawfiq and ability to take this responsibility very serious. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to execute the responsibilities we hold to our wealth right till the end. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa ta'ala.